Jujutsu Kaisen has just revealed the most insane story elements that shape the final chapter of the manga. Number one, there's more ancient history that links to Satoru Gojo's plan and why he was sealed. <laughs> Number two, what is Yuta's curse technique? <laughs> yeah, boy. And number three, the truth regarding Rika's return since she, you know, died in Jujutsu Kaisen movie Zero. I am so confused right now. Before I can explain these three major reveals, we need to recap what happened in chapter 177 of the Culling Games since you know, yeah, most I'm of you confused are confused. Right now, We're in the middle of some back-to-back -back insane chapters focused on Yuta Akatsu or as we also know him as the first protagonist of Jujutsu Kaisen. And let me tell you, he's been living up to his title more than ever right now. Yuta is in between a heated battle with two sorcerers from the past, Takaka Uro and Ryu Ishigori, where Yuta is proving that he's a one-man army just like his sensei, you guessed it, Satoru freaking Gojo himself. I am hyped as you can tell. In chapter 177, Yuta and Ryu engaged in close combat and Yuta took on Ryu's massive granite blast with his bare hands. This is a huge feat because Ryu boasts the highest curse energy output in the entire Cullen games. So every attack of his is bound to be explosive. Pun intended by the way. Whilst Yuta was dealing with Ryu, Takako couldn't sit still to miss out on the fun and interrupted the fight with a heavy sneak attack with a sky manipulation technique on Yuta. Thankfully, Yuta took low damage and is in good condition because of his proficiency in reverse curse technique. Yuta has been using the reverse curse technique constantly in all of his fights to keep moving forward with his mission to kill Kenjaku instead of Gojo. As he stated in chapter 176, he wants to protect his sensei from suffering to kill his best friend once again. Just like Takako and Ryu, readers were led to believe that Yuta was finally exhausted and his bottomless curse energy was on the verge of burning up. But you guessed it. Yuta said, I'm gonna pull up with my trump card, bitch. He wore his wedding ring that appeared in Jujutsu Kaisen movie Zero, which has a connection to none other than Rika at his service. This battle has just turned delicious. Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> As Ryu would say that because Yuta is finally getting serious. In chapter 178, we finally get to see Rika and Yuta in action together and we are told how Rika returned or you know more accurately speaking she never did confused well let's start from the top in chapter 137 Yuta made a banger entry into the main story a long time after the events of Jujutsu Kaisen Zero to know what transpired in the prequel do check out this video where we delve deep into Yuta's full story and how he connects to Gojo's dream for the final chapter of JJK it's important to know that Yuta was a special grade sorcerer because of Rika Orimoto's cursed spirit latching onto him Rika was Yuta's childhood lover and upon her death she had turned into a cursed spirit that stopped Yuta from living a normal life. To free himself from Rika's curse, Yuta had to join the Tokyo Jujutsu School under Satoru Gojo and also fought an intense battle with Geto Suguru, another special grade sorcerer. After these events, it turned out that it was Yuta who actually cursed Rika's soul and kept her from passing away. Yuta's promise of staying with Rika forever and accepting her death freed Rika and her soul appeared in her human form. We all clearly saw Yuta say his final goodbye to Rika Orimoto and Yuta even lost his special grade title. It was only for a while though, Yuta went abroad for training and within 3 months of turning into a grade 3 sorcerer, he reclaimed his special grade badge. Why or how, none of us had a clue at the time. But Yuta's appearance in chapter 139 cleared up one doubt, his special grade was because of Rika returning to his side. And in chapter 141, we saw a new Rika appearing out of three 
will to protect Yuta against Yuji Itadori. This only added to the speculations that somehow Rika Orimoto had either not passed away or had come back to Yuta out of her own wish. In fact, some fans in our community had also speculated that the new Rika was simply Yuta recreating the original cursed spirit. However, chapter 178 shot down all the theories and finally showed us the truth. As it turns out, Rika Orimoto did indeed pass on after all, and the new Rika we see in the present is nothing more than a living external storage. This Rika is connected to Yuta through his ring, and their connection gives Yuta access to a huge number of curse techniques and endless curse energy. Remember the promise I mentioned Yuta made to Rika? He said they would be together forever, back in JJK Zero. And <laughs> it seems that Rika Orimoto response was, and I took that personally, <laughs> It became personal with me. According to the new chapter, Rika left her cursed spirit form as storage with Yuta after passing away. We can even say Yuta's promise was sort of a binding vow in place that led to this new Rika coming into existence. If you're unclear about this whole new and old Rika affair, again, I suggest you watch our video on Yuta and Rika. But honestly, this Rika reveal explains a lot about Yuta. Like how does she have consciousness? It seems a lot like Yuta is training her in the past few chapters and that reminds me of how Toji Fushigoro trained a cursed spirit to store his weapons, as Akadami mentioned this in a fan book confirming it. There's a whole bunch of questions about how cursed spirits can pay heed to human commands but we also have important information on Yuta's abilities. In his fight against special grade sorcerer Geto, Yuta had used a special move which was Inomaki's inherited technique, cursed speech. This this technique is a double-edged sword that harmed even the sorcerer using it as a backlash. But in Yuta's case, he faced no drawbacks using it and could even use commands like die without a problem, which was, you know, impossible even for someone trained like Inumaki himself. This is how we knew that Yuta could copy cursed techniques, but this chapter confirmed that Yuta's cursed technique is officially mimicry. And from what we can see, Rika is like the arsenal of of all the curse techniques Yuta can copy. What's even more important is how this instance was a big foreshadowing to Akotami revealing Rika's true nature and Yuta's curse technique. If we look closely in this panel from Jujutsu Kaisen chapter 140, we can see Rika conjured up a loudspeaker marked with the Unamaki family sigil of snake eyes and fangs. So Yuta could not use curse speech directly, but Rika stored a medium in which which he could do so. And in chapter 177, we get to see that it is indeed true. Rika has an arsenal of weapons that Yuta can use to copy a bunch of curse techniques. This means that every weapon represents a different curse technique that is at Yuta's disposal at any point in time. This is overpowered on so many levels because the only entity we know in Jujutsu Kaisen to have multiple curse techniques or copy them is is the king of curses Sukuna himself. Even Sathro freaking Gojo, the strongest sorcerer in Jujutsu Kaisen history, has only two techniques. However, Yuta can only use these curse techniques and Rika's curse energy when they are connected through the ring from his childhood. Without the ring, he can still summon Rika and Commander according to his need in battle, but the ring allows Rika's complete manifestation. He even fills up Yuta's depleted curse energy, like Ryu noticed when Rika appeared. But the only drawback until now is that Yuta's connection to Rika lasts for only 5 minutes. Now that we know Yuta's curse technique is copy or mimicry, we have to know the conditions and limits of using it. We don't know if Yuta could use copy without Rika or is it something he got along with her. If Yuta could use copy without Rika, then there's an interesting possibility we have to explore. We already know that Rika's parents died under mysterious circumstances, but the girl herself survived each time. We talked more about it in this video being displayed to you right now, but what if 
if she had the ability to curse people close to her. This would explain her parents' mysterious death that involved her. We know that curse techniques start developing between the ages of 4 to 6, and if Yuta, who was barely a child back then, had already manifested his mimicry curse technique unknowingly, he could have copied Rika's ability to curse loved ones. This analysis can be a solid explanation as to why Rika manifested as a cursed spirit, as Yuta would have copied her technique and cursed her just as Gojo confirmed he did. Yuta is also a descendant of a vengeful spirit, which would explain why Rika was able to come back as one as well. Yuta has unlimited curse energy, which means it also explains why Rika is so overpowered in the first place, and how the new Rika we currently see exists as well. Our analysis would also prove that Kenjaku had underestimated Yuta in chapter 90 because clearly Yuta's abilities go further than just copying curse techniques. The conditions and limits of Yuta's mimicry needs to be revealed but it might be him defeating the owner of a technique or fully understanding the curse technique he wishes to copy but there isn't any limit to the number of curse techniques he can copy which makes him even more busted. At any rate, Yuta currently is showing exactly why Satoru Gojo had so many hopes for him and why he can match his power level. We hope to explain Yuta's power level in a future video but we need your support. Please hit the notification bell for our channel and like the video for more Jujutsu Kaisen content. I will now pass on the video to Harrison as he will explain the later part of the chapter and how this links to Satoru Gojo's final plan regarding changing the Jujutsu Sorcery Society. Thank you Adil. Now let's move back onto chapter 178 as there are many more insane reveals such as the Fujiwara clan and Satoru Gojo's main goal at the end of the manga. So instead of scaring them, Yuta getting all serious only excited his opponents Takako and Ryu. Now I'll be honest okay, Ryu and Takako didn't look like the kind of characters I expected to contribute much to the story. But with every new chapter, both of them are proving to be excellent opponents to give us a taste of things to come. Since both of them are quick on the uptake, they realise that Yuta had not shown his full potential yet when he called upon Rika. And Takako also realised that she was the first target of the yuta Rico duo, but she's not someone to go down quite that easily. As soon as she started getting ready for an attack, Rika suddenly closed the distance between them both. On the other hand, Yuta covered his mouth only to reveal that he was using the cursed speech technique again. And this time, he didn't even need a loudspeaker with snake eyes and fangs because the sigil appeared on his mouth just like Inumaki. He commanded Takako to not move, which froze her on the spot. This attack also proved that Yuta had worked insanely hard to refine this technique from the last time that he used it against Geto. Those that have seen the Jujutsu Kaisen movie will remember that he had noted that cursed speech was quite hard to use because the cursed energy spreads and he had to tune it to be focused at one point. But now it looks as though Yuta has long overcome this hurdle because before Takako could even fully process him even using cursed speech, Yuta managed to freeze her and then landed a combined attack along with Rika. And I mean, judging by her facial expression, I think it is safe to say that she didn't enjoy that one. Get on, fucked up now! I'm honestly quite surprised that Takako didn't just fall from the impact, but I suppose at the end of the day, she was the head of an assassin group back in the day. So yeah, right, I can understand that a punch or two isn't really enough to take her down. Yuta then asked Rika to help him jump across to where Takako was flying in the air, but Ryu decided it was this moment that he had to attack. He launched another one of his granite blasts, but instead of hitting Yuta, it hit Rika. And just like her master, Rika also stopped the blast with a single fist, and Ryu noted that Rika's block was just as powerful as Yuta's. But uh, guess what? Rika wasn't really all that pleased that a random attack was hurled at her and hurt her too. And so she did what everyone would do in this moment and closed the distance between the two of them in a flash and told Ryu that that hurt. It was at this moment that he knew he fucked up. Rika straight up landed a sucker punch with her huge fist on Ryu's face, sending him flying. <laughs> Only to then chase for another punch. Like, stop, man. That's enough. 
However, Ryu refused to back down without a fight and punched Rika with enough cursed energy to make her crash into a building. I, hey, you know what, actually? Fair play, that, that's, that's pretty damn impressive. This series of events excited Ryu even more and his hunger for a good fight as his dessert is rising with every passing second. Now going back to Yuta, he also got into an interesting battle with Takako. Yuta used his hair as a medium for Shikigami which looked like the bat version of Rika. Which, and I can't believe I'm saying this man alright, has only made Yuta even more busted as he is using multiple mimicry techniques now at once. The Shikigami seemed like a copied curse technique and sure enough Takako recognised it. Do you remember the old man from chapter 173 who was supposed to be one of the four most important players in the Sandai colony? Uh, yeah, the same old man called Druv Lak Dwa Dwa I'm the one person on this channel who can't say this name man. Sid, can, can you help me from, what does this say? I can't read. Yo, what's up? Hold up. Dr what the? Why is an Indian dude doing in Japan in JJK? <laughs> How does that make sense? Anyway, continue, Harrison. Anyway, Dorov had two independent Shikigami with a domain compromising the Shikigami's orbiting trajectories. For all that build-up, he sure hadn't shown us anything. Well, <laughs> leave it all up to Yuta to do all the flashy things just like the senpai that he is. He copied Dorov's technique and used it on Takako to create a domain and cut her up at several places on her body. Just when she realised what the new Shikigami she was seeing was and what Yuta's technique actually is, he moved in to punch her again. Although she somehow evaded the attack and landed at a different place, Yuta kept up with her and punched her again. It didn't really seem like he was serious with it though as Takako did block it with her palms alone. It seems like Yuta wasn't done talking with Takako just yet. In chapter 167, both of them had indulged in a bit of the trademark Jujutsu Kaisen moral talk between two opponents. It's always a marvel to see how Akutami sets up different characters with clashing morals, with legitimate reasons to give us food for thought, and this exchange was no different. Yuta was someone who had lived until now only because of the others in his life. His teachers and his friends of the Jujutsu high and hence his entire life was dedicated to living for them and doing what he could do for them. Even taking part in the culling games was to protect Gojo, his friends and his juniors like Yuji and Megumi. On the other hand though, Takako seemed to live only for herself and to kill people for her own enjoyment. This had triggered Takako to an unexplainable degree and made her ask if Yuta belonged to the Fujiwara clan. All we know about Yuta's ancestors was that while his family were all non-sorcerers, he was a distant relative of Gojo and Sugawara no Michizane, one of the three great vengeful spirits of the Jujutsu world. But historically speaking, the Fujiwara and Sugiwara clans had a deep running connection, but none of it was nice. Takako also had a similar history with the Fujiwara clan, apparently. She was the captain of the Sun, Moon and Stars group, which was the assassin group of the Fujiwara family. This squad was so dedicated to their work in the shadows that they are denied a name. But it seems like someone from the Fujiwara clan tricked Takako into rising to a reputable position with false promises and then made her into a scapegoat for all the murders he committed in his own family. She once again claims that Yuta is a Fujiwara and asked him if he was that scared of her potential. It hints at the fact that Takako was immensely talented back in her day but she was unfortunate and got caught up in this sinister plan. But Yuta tells her that he didn't know what his ancestors had done to her. But living for yourself will render anyone unable to keep going on with life because someday it will start to lose meaning. She rightfully thinks that living for someone else's sake is a luxury only people who have already earned fame for themselves can afford. In her past life, she must have been a nobody who had lived her life under the commands of the Fujiwara family. But in the end, she could not even fend for herself because she was just a pawn in the hands of the people who had enough reputation. The way Takako feels about the Fujiwara clan seems a lot like the current Jujutsu society. Killing their own blood, treating unfortunate people as scapegoats, and even going as far as murdering talented youngsters is a true in today's Jujutsu world as it was back in Takako's era. It proves that nothing has changed in all these centuries and nobody stood up against it. Or rather, they did not have enough power to do so even if they tried to. <laughs> I, I think we all know someone 
who has it in his locker, am I right? Uh, white hair, blindfold, sexy as fuck, beautiful eyes. Ah! Satoru freaking Gojo, man! Like, come on! It looks like he's out on a mission to do the impossible, but then again, we have Ghetto saying precisely what we want to say about this. Even if it's an impossible deal, only Satoru Gojo is someone who could make it a reality. And he knows it. Changing the Jujutsu world from the inside out through his students is more than just a dream of Gojo's. It's like his life purpose. And if Yuta is indeed a Fujiwara, it would mean that Gojo's plan to change the Jujutsu system society is working pretty well. This is because as clear as Yuta's response to Takako is, none of the youngsters under him harbour vicious feelings for others. In their eyes, everyone is equal and all that matters is their potential as a sorcerer and value as a human being. In chapter 178, they all reach their way to the same rooftop as Ryu and Rika. They are here to have a fight that will serve as the ultimate dessert. But seeing that all three of them were in some sort of a stalemate at this point, the only option to win Win was to use the ultimate form of their cursed techniques, Domain Expansion. And it's not just one, it's not just two. We're talking Takako, Ryu and Yuta. All three of them have decided to use their Domain Expansion at the same time. Oh my god, the, oh, this series is just peak fiction at this point, man. Oh, Jujutsu Kaisen's goaded, Yuta's goaded, Rika's goaded, Gojo's goaded, you're a goat, you? You, you watching this video as well? <laughs> and if you want to become even more of a goat, by the way, you can watch this video on your screen right now to learn more about Rika. Go on, you want to be a goat, don't you?